Well, good morning, Hollywood Community Church. Good morning. Thank you for joining us in person. Thank you for joining us online. I ask you if you're able to rise to your feet here and at home, and let's praise the Lord this morning. Here we go. Next one is a brand new one for us. It's called Over Jordan and Across the Sea, and it goes like this.
Amen. What a great song. There's a wedding waiting on the other side. I can't wait. You may be seated if you're here with us today. Our scripture reading is found in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, and he said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them then he said to him so shall your offspring be catch this verse and Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness what what a great verse and Chase is going to be developing that as we look in Romans chapter 4 today but it's believing God that produces righteousness in our lives. So this morning we want to have a time of prayer in our service. There's much to pray for. There are many to pray for. So we want to give you an opportunity to pray, whether you're here physically in our service or whether you're watching us online. We want to ask you to take a few moments to pray. So would you pray for your family? And I'd ask you to pray for several things. I'd encourage you to pray that you, you would remain connected to God's Word during this time. That you would remain connected to your church family during this time, whether it's physically or whether it's online. And would you pray that you can make a difference in our community? These are unique days. 
And these are days in which the church should step up and be the living church of God. So we want to pray. Let's pray for those in our family who are struggling. We have people in our family who are struggling physically. Some have uh, the virus and they're struggling with that. Others have different health issues. But we also have people in our congregation who are struggling financially. Others who are struggling emotionally. Others who are struggling spiritually. We just really need to pray during this time. So let me encourage you. Bow your head and bow your heart. If you're at home, would you gather your family around? Let's take just a few moments in prayer. I'm going to allow you to pray. And then I'll come back in a few moments and lead us corporately in prayer together. Let's pray together as a church family. Father, as we unite our hearts together as a church family, we ask that you would hear our prayer. We cry out to you asking you to answer prayers on our behalf. What I read this morning in James 5, 16, that, that the effectual prayers of a righteous man or woman has much effect. So God, we pray believing believing that you not only hear us, but believing that you answer our prayers. So we pray today for our church family. We pray for those who are sick, Lord, some of them with COVID, others with other illnesses right now. Lord, how we pray that you'd come alongside of them and, and heal them. We believe with all of our heart that you have the power to do that. And so we ask that you would. We pray for those who are struggling financially right now, some who have lost their jobs and, and others who are just trying to scrape together enough to pay their bills. We pray that you would be Jehovah Jireh to them, the God who provides. We pray for those who are struggling emotionally. Lord, they're, they're discouraged, they're depressed, maybe because of quarantine, maybe because of other situations. But Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, help them to find their encouragement in you. And we pray for those who are struggling spiritually right now. Lord, some who have disconnected from you, some who have disconnected from their church. God, how I pray that you would meet them today at their point of need. God, help us to make a difference in our community. Help us to be the church, Lord, not only when we meet together physically, but when we can't meet together physically. Help us to be the church of the living God and help us to be your representatives. We thank you for what you're doing in and through our lives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We want to welcome you to our service today. If you're here physically, thank you so much for being with us. If you're watching online, thank you so much for participating online. And we just want you to stay connected, whether it's physically in our service or whether it's online, we want you to stay connected. I've shared with our leadership team that George Barna just came out with a statistic, and it's a discouraging one that one in three practicing Christians have disconnected from their church during this pandemic. They're not worshiping physically or they're not worshiping online, and I'm glad that's not you. You are here either physically or online, and so we want to encourage you to stay connected, but welcome. If you're here for the first time, if you're watching online for the first time, thank you so much for participating with us. I believe online, there's an online attendance form. Would you be kind enough to fill that out and allow us to know that you are worshiping with us? 
Um, let me give you just a couple of announcements. So uh, every Monday at 1 o'clock, I do an online uh, class study that we're simply calling Monday Moments with Brian. I'd love to have you participate with us. We do that Mondays online at 1 o'clock via Zoom. If you would like to participate, you can send me an email to brian at ourhcc.org, and we would love for you to participate. I'll send you a Zoom invite, and you can participate with us tomorrow at 1 o'clock. That's one of the ways that you can stay connected. Here's another way. Next Sunday, We want to take the Lord's Supper together as a family, and we want to do it in a unique way. We want to do it online. So we're going to take the Lord's Supper at 5 o'clock next Sunday afternoon, July 26th, online. We're going to do that via Zoom. We will send you a Zoom invite. All of you will get an email this week with a Zoom invite. And that's just a way in this day and age that we can come together and take the Lord's Supper. So you'll have to provide the elements yourself, the juice and the crackers. And so we wanted to give you a heads up so you can be doing that. And then we also kind of divide up and have a time for us to get to know one another. And so mark that on your calendars. That's another way for you to stay connected. That's next Sunday afternoon, July 26th at 5 p.m. We're going to do an online communion service. We did it uh, last month and it was a real blessing. I think we had 40 or 50 different families online and we would love to have you participate with us as well. Well, one more thing before Jonas and the team comes back. Let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving. And so there's the, there's several ways that you can give. If you're here with us today, you can give in the boxes that are in back. Obviously, we're not passing the offering plate but you can also mail your gift in. You can get on our app, and you can give through our app, or you can text give as well. There's a variety of ways that you can do that. And I would say this, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness because it is only through the faithfulness of your giving and your generosity that we're able to continue to doing many of the things that we're doing. So thank you so much for that. Let's pray, and then Jonas can continue. God, thank you for your generosity to us. And God, I pray you'd help us to follow the example of Jesus. You loved us so much that you gave. Lord, I pray that our love for you would be demonstrated through our giving as well. And so, Lord, I pray that our gifts, whether they're given online or or in the mail or however they're given, I pray that they would be a demonstration of our love and our commitment to you. Continue to meet our needs, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's continue worshiping together. If you're here with us, stand with me. If you're at home, stand up and let's worship together. Jesus. 
Jesus, you may be seated. So, so today um, we have another one of our team who's going to be speaking. One of the things that I enjoy during the summer, if you've been here long enough, you know I kind of back off a little bit in the pulpit and allow some of our other men to preach. Several weeks ago, Wilson Oscar spoke and did a fantastic job. And our speaker today is uh, one of our staff, one of our newer staff. Chase Reisner is coming to bring the message today. If you're unfamiliar with Chase, he's, at least when we were having physical services, he was in the background and not up front very often. But Chase is our next-gen director, our children's ministry and our youth director. He is a graduate of Moody Bible Institute, and you know I'm a fan of Moody Bible Institute. Graduate of Moody Bible Institute. He is enrolling now to begin a master's program in elementary, or no, in in education, a master of education. He gave it to me, actually, with an emphasis on human development counseling. That sounds really easy, does it not? Really, Really intelligent young man, but most importantly, Chase has a big heart for God, and he loves people, and we're thrilled to have him be a part of our team. So, Chase, you come on up, and you bring the message today. God bless you. Good morning, guys. Oh, it feels good to be on the stage again. I haven't been on the stage since we closed down our youth program, so it feels good to be in front of you guys. Um, And actually, I have something to say. My mom was supposed to be here today. Um, My mom and my brother were supposed to come into town this weekend and uh, be able to spend the time with me, but uh, because of everything, they weren't able to. And actually, my eldest sister was just diagnosed with uh, coronavirus, so I would ask for your prayer for my family as uh, she, she is feeling a little sick, and uh, the rest of my family was also with her, so just prayers for them. But I just want to say that my mom has a favorite person in this world. It's not me. I wish it was me, but it's not me. It's my nephew, Jason. So my other sister has a son. He's four now. He just had his fourth birthday, um, so he's starting preschool in the fall. But uh, we have done everything we can to potty train him. Now, how many of you guys have potty trained kids before? So you know that it's somewhat difficult. Sometimes it's more difficult than others. And sometimes you guys have been blessed with just being able to set your child on the potty and then figuring it out on their own. But for those of you that haven't, you understand the struggle. So when we first started potty training Jason, we have a picture of him up here. Uh, He loves making goofy uh, faces over uh, FaceTime and everything. So when we first started potty training Jason, we said, big boys use the potty. He said, I'm a baby. He said, I'm a baby. I don't want to use the potty. Okay, big boys don't get to get dessert. Or babies don't get to get desserts. So only big boys do. So if you want dessert, you've got to go use the potty. Well, I'm a baby. So he just kept doing this over and over again. And we just kept trying to think of ways to, to, to get him to do what we were, wanted him to do, what he was supposed to do. Uh, Now, some guys, you know, we like target practice uh, when we're using the potty. Uh, Well, this wasn't what uh, encouraged Jason. We got everything that we could to try to get him to do stuff, but nothing seemed to work until we promised him rewards. We got this sticker chart. I mean, if you guys have potty trained, you probably have seen this this in place, the sticker chart. Um, And every time he went potty in the toilet like he was supposed to, he would put a sticker. And when he would get so many stickers, he would get a reward. Easy, simple, right? Now, of course, we had to change the rewards as time went on because he would get used to it and be like, well, I don't want that reward anymore. I get to play video games all the time. I don't want to an extra hour. I don't care about that. So we would have to change it and constantly change the reward. But the, the thing is, is that he learned over time that 
if he did what he was supposed to, he would get this reward, which is exactly what we wanted him to do. Now, I think a lot of times we view God this way. A lot of times we view God, if we do exactly what we're supposed to, we'll get this reward. I think a lot of times we talk about justification this way. We think that if we do what we're supposed to, then God will forgive us for our sins. Last week, Pastor Brian preached on justification. Now, if you guys uh, don't remember, if you weren't listening, or if you weren't able to tune in, justification is the act of being uh, considered righteous or perfect before God as a judge. Now, Brian gave the illustration of a judge and jury, la jury last week, and that's exactly what it is. So when we view God, we view it as we have to do these things. Sometimes we view it as a scale, right? Like if my good outweighs my bad, then it's good enough. If my good is, is more than my bad, then, then God will, will protect me. God will forgive me. God will justify me. But this isn't what Scripture teaches. This isn't what Scripture teaches at all. And, and Pastor Brian gave a little bit of an illustration last week but in Romans chapter 3. But Romans chapter 4 continues this. You see, the end of Romans chapter 3, Paul gives, uh, lays out exactly what justification by faith is. The beginning of chapter 4 is in an illustration of this. So he gives an illustration of what he means in the previous chapter. Of course, Paul didn't have chapter breaks. So let's just begin and, and let's see what this says. So I'm going to start in chapter 4, and I'm going to read in verses 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. You see, what Paul is saying here is that Abraham, you see, now he's talking to the Jewish people. There's points in, in Romans where he talks to the Jewish people, he talks to the Gentiles, and he talks to the church in general. At this point, he's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to the founder of the Jewish people, the father of the Jewish people, Abraham. He's saying, if Abraham, the father of our faith, was justified by his works, then he has something to boast about. You see, what Paul is saying is that you get paid according to your wages. So, hopefully most of us have jobs in here. Um, if you're my age, you have a job. And you get paid for what you do. Those are your wages. That's what you earn. That's not how it works with justification. You see, Paul says actually the opposite. He says that Abraham was justified by his faith. In fact, he quotes the passage that Brian read for us earlier. Uh, Genesis 15, 6. He says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham did not earn his righteousness. Rather, it was given to him because of his faith. You see, it wasn't anything that Abraham did. It wasn't because he did this or didn't do that. It was simply because of his faith. You see, that's how God always works. We see through in Scripture, I'm going to use this phrase numerously today, but it, uh, God works by grace, through faith, and the revealed Word of God. It is always like that. God always provides salvation by grace, through faith, and the revealed Word of God. You see, this is the faith that Abraham had. You see, God promised him that he would have many descendants. Well, at the time, Abraham was really old. So old that he didn't think he was going to have kids anymore. And so he didn't believe God. He thought his, his servant, Eliezer, was going to be the uh, heir to his, to his possessions. But God promised him, no, I'm going to give you a son. And that son is going to be the fulfillment of these promises. You see, then Abraham believed the Lord. And it says that Abraham was credited or counted as righteous. Now, this is a weird phrase. In Hebrew, it's a, it's a word, hashtep, which you guys don't need to know that. I, I was a Jewish studies major at Moody, so I love Hebrew. I love the Jewish culture. But what this is, means is reckon. Now, I like that phrase, too, because I'm from Alabama originally. And if we say, I reckon that, then that means we consider it. But that's not the kind of reckon we're talking about. We're talking about, like, accredited, which means, like, 
you don't have this, but it's given to you. Just like a credit card, right? You don't have that money. You don't have the money that's on a credit card, but it's given to you as if you do. You see, that's exactly what's happening with Abraham, is that he didn't have this righteousness. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. But God did. God had that credit, and he gave it to Abraham. He gave it to him so that it would be his. Now, if you're like me, this pauses another second. Well, if Abraham didn't work for his salvation, what is faith? Is faith itself not a work? Is faith itself not something that you do? It says Abraham believed God. But that's doing something. And clearly we said last week that you can't do anything to earn salvation. So how, does, how do those things work together? Well, faith is a gift from God, not a work of our own. Now you ask how I can say this. Well, I have other passages to read for you. So I have Philippians 1.29. And then Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. I'll read the Philippians passage first. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And then Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. You see, what this is saying is that we don't earn our faith. It's not something that we have. It's not something that we do. We don't believe. It's a gift from God from the beginning. He grants us the ability to believe. He grants us the ability to have faith. You see, faith is a gift from God in the first place. He gives it to us abundantly out of his mercy for us, out of his love for us, out of his grace for us, by grace, through faith, and the revealed word of God. You see, God had mercy on us. This, uh, these undeserving sin sinners, we learned earlier in Romans how we are all sinners, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. But... God. God had grace. And he gives us the ability to have faith. And we'll talk about later uh, on in the next few weeks through who, what, who's given that faith and who isn't, and what does that mean for unbelievers versus what does that mean for believers. That's covered later on, because Paul realizes that these are going to be objections that people have to his, to his argument, so he presents those later on in, in the book of Romans. And if you want to talk about that before we get to it, feel free to come and talk to me. I love the book of Romans. It has a lot to do with God's heart for the Jewish people. So just come talk to me anytime. Shoot me an email at chase at rhcc.org um, or uh, come find me here. I'm usually here. But that brings me to my next point. I'm going to read the next few um, pass uh, verses and then we'll get to it. Okay, I'm going to start in verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. You see, now it's getting a little confusing because Paul's bringing in a different illustration. Now he's, going, he's stepping away from Abraham and he's bringing in David. Who is David? Well, obviously he's the king of Israel. He's the perfect king of Israel. In fact, scripture says he was a man after God's own heart. But still, why is he? Paul bringing these two passages that are kind of saying the same thing, but kind of not at the same time. Why is he bringing them together? And we got to remember that Paul was a rabbi. Paul was a Pharisee. And so he's actually using a very rabbinic uh, method of interpretation. It's called Gerashav, Gerasa, Shava. And what that means is that it's a lot like a legal uh, dispute. So if you go to a courtroom, you're going to have precedents that are set, right? A precedent is like where a ruling was said before. And so you use the previous rulings to determine your future rulings, and you, you use the same words and, and vocabulary. And so that's what Paul is doing here. You see, the same word is used in Psalm 32 that it's used in Hebrew, uh, Genesis uh, 15, 6. The same word is used. So for uh, biblical studies, people, it's, it's kind of like a word study. 
is what we would call a word study today in hermeneutics. But what he follows is that Genesis 15, 6 does not say that, uh, the, uh, that Abraham had the forgiveness of sins. It just says that he was credited as righteousness. It does not say anything about his forgiveness of sins, that his sins are gone. That as uh, Brian mentioned last week, they're as far as the east is from the west, which is another illustration I love. Because you can go north, and eventually you'll start going south, but if you go east, you're never going to go west. If you go west, you're never going to go east. So why does Paul bring up David? Because in the passage in Psalm 32, David illustrates that this is a reference, being counted as righteousness, being accredited, hushtab. It's forgiveness of sins. And the same thing is true for us. The same thing is true for us. When we are credited as righteousness, when we have that faith, we receive that forgiveness of sins. We receive that justification that Brian mentioned last week. We are righteous before God. Which brings me to the next point. I'll read verses 9 through 12. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So the righteousness would be counted to them as well to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Okay, so I don't know how many times it's been circumcised. Um, It's an awkward word for anyone that's not in the Jewish culture. But what this is saying is that circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. God made this promise to Abraham, and he said, the way that you will remember it It's through circumcision. In the same way that we remember that God's promise to Noah is always there by the rainbow, right? And so the rainbow represents God's promise to Noah, just like circumcision represents God's promise to Abraham. But the thing is, sometimes we think that the act of circumcision, this work, was what justified Abraham. We think that this was the work that he did. And so therefore, only Jewish people can get saved. Because only Jewish people are under that covenant, right? Paul says, no, that's not true. You see, Abraham was justified. He was credited as righteous before he was circumcised. Before he was the first Hebrew. Before he was Jewish. You see, Abraham is the, this, this mixture between Gentile and, and Israelite. He's both. So, therefore, he represents the entirety of the church, both the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, and the circumcised, the Jewish people. These two groups. So, it's not just Jewish people who are saved by faith, but it's also Gentiles, most of us in this room. We all experience God by grace, through faith, in the the revealed word of God. When I say that, I will put it out plainly. It's by grace that you have been given faith. That faith leads to you being declared righteous. That in the revealed word of God, that for us right now is Christ the Son. He has been revealed to us fully. So, what does this mean for us? While God's promises to the physical descendants of Abraham remain, we inherit the spiritual benefits. You see, we all gain Abraham's benefit of righteousness. Therefore, he is our spiritual father. He's not our ethnic father, not unless you're Jewish, right? Or Arab. He is our spiritual father. What does it mean to have a spiritual father? It means that we follow in his footsteps. It means that just like Abraham, we are saved through faith. Just like Abraham, it's God's grace that gives us that faith. Just like Abraham... We are justified, not of our own doing, but because God 
is merciful and loving and compassionate. So I have three application points, and, and normally I, I do three steps when I talk to the youth. I go from here to here to here. The stage in the youth room is a lot smaller. Uh, so what, what I do when I do that is I usually start here, and I talk about what it means for an unbeliever. That means that if you are here today and you are not a follower of Christ, if you would not call yourself a, a Christian, if you would not call, deem yourself as someone walking according to how uh, God has laid out in Scripture, the, His revealed Word, then this is for you. This point is for you. Find rest in this. Give up striving. You see, God is the one who does the work. No matter what you do, it's never going to be good enough. In fact, there's a verse that uh, we were talking about this week because in Hebrew it's a little bit more vulgar than the English version. But uh, I, think, I think we know what it is. It's Isaiah 64, 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. You see, no, no good that you do is good enough. You see, all your good deeds to God, they're like a polluted garment. And in Hebrew, it's a vulgar word, meaning minstrel rags. Very gross. Dirty minstrel rags. Used minstrel rags. That's how your good deeds are. They mean nothing. So what hope is there? I mean, that's what all of the first half of Romans has talked about, is that you are sinners. Where's the hope? The hope is that God is giving you the gift of faith. He's giving you the opportunity to accept it. It's now your duty to do it. It's now your duty to follow through with it. So stop striving after your own works. Stop striving after doing what, trying to outweigh the good versus bad. Stop working. And the second point I have, it, the last two are actually for believers. I usually do an internal one, what you should focus on inside, and then an external one, what it looks like to the world. So I'll tell you the internal one first. It's very similar to the unbeliever. Stop striving. Take rest. Rest in God. You see, Jesus says that in, in Matthew uh, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, a lot of times as believers, we take, okay, we know that our salvation is by faith. And we know that our justification is by faith alone. But then, but then we begin this process of, oh man, I really got to work hard to please God now. I really got to do this. I, I got to go to church every Sunday. I got to do this. I got to tithe. I got to do this. I got to love my neighbor. I got to do this. All those are true. We are commanded to follow the law of Christ. But none of it is by your own strength. You see, saints, we are called to rely on God. We are called to use God's strength to do those things. When we strive after our, our own, when we do it out of our own efforts, we fail. We can't do it. It's impossible. But when we have God's strength, that's when we're able to love. That's when we're able to serve. That's when we're able to be more holy. You see, we separate justification and, and this phrase called sanctification, and what the process of being made holy, and we separate the two. I don't think that's how Scripture views it. You see, they go hand in hand. Sanctification begins at the moment of justification. But sanctification isn't primarily a work of you. It's primarily a work of the Holy Spirit through you. Now, there is human responsibility, and you, you do have the responsibility to, to kill the sin in your life. The mortification of sin is what it's called. But I think a lot of times, especially in the American culture, in my own life, we try to work. We try to do. We try to obtain this thing that isn't going to be there. It's unattainable. You see, God says, Jesus says, 
My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Find rest in me. That's what he's saying to you today. Now my last point. I'm going to move to this edge of the stage because this is the external point. This is what it means for the world. You see, I think a lot of times we, uh, and I'm so guilty of this. I, I mean, anyone that knows me can say, say this. I think a lot of times we get on that high horse and we say, you know, I'm not as bad as the sinner as them. You know, I deserve faith, but they don't. I deserve justification, but they don't. I think a lot of times we, we take a step high and we view ourselves higher than how we should. But that's not true for the Christian. That's not how we're supposed to live. You see, we're supposed to view ourselves with humility. So I'm going to look at my notes because I, I liked how I worded it. Be cautious how you view your righteousness. You did not earn it. You see, Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, he says this, verses, verses 3 through 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do you not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, I think a lot of times we're a lot like the Jewish people in the first century. We view our righteousness as deserved. I'm a descendant of Abraham. Or modern day, my grandfather was a pastor. I've been in church my whole life. I know what, what to do. I know the culture. I know what to say, how to act, what to wear, what not to wear. None of those is what makes you righteous. None of those are earned. You see, righteousness is not earned. And when we have this correct understanding, we begin to see others with this love and compassion. The same compassion that Jesus saw uh, the multitudes with. The same compassion that God saw on us. We begin to see others as higher than ourselves. We don't look at, at them and say, man, they're really struggling. I'm glad I'm not them. We say, man, I'm really struggling. Praise God that he helps me. D.L. Moody has a quote. Uh, again, I went to Moody Bible Institute. I'm going to quote D.L. Moody. Uh, he says, uh, D.L. Moody struggles the most with D.L. Moody. You see, that's, that's what, what he means is that he shouldn't struggle with anyone else. He shouldn't struggle with other people's unrighteousness or, or whether or not they appear, appeal to the culture that is set at the church. He struggles with himself. He struggles with the internal. You see, I think God wants us to focus on ourselves, our righteousness, the log that is in our own eyes, more than the speck that is in our brothers. Because once we focus on the log, and once we start working towards our salvation with fear and trembling, then we can mentor and disciple others. So, I'll go back to those three points. If you're an unbeliever today, God is offering you the gift of salvation. He's offering you the gift of freedom. Freedom from strife, from struggling. Accept it. That's all you have to do. All Abraham did was believe. That's all you have to do. There's no prayer that you have to say. There's no tithe that you have to give. There's no person you have to talk to. All you have to do is believe. You see, Scripture says, admit that you're a sinner. Believe that God, that God's Son is Jesus, and that on the third day He rose from the dead. And then confess your sins. ABCs. That's what we use in children's ministry all the time. That's all you have to do. Likewise, believer, <laughs> stop striving. Stop wrestling. Focus on God. He'll take care of you. He'll heal you. He promises to. He promises to continue the faithful work that he has started. Take hope in that. And lastly, view others with that same grace that you give yourself. 
view the same, view each other with the same grace that God gives you. Love one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. That's what I have for you guys today. If you don't take anything away except for this, I want you to hear that God loves you. He is offering you this gift of salvation. And it's free. It's on him. He gives you that credit. That credit card, I don't have this money, but he gives it to me. I don't have this righteousness, but he gives it to me anyways. Feel free to contact any of the pastors or anyone in this congregation if you would like more information on what it means to be a follower of Christ. We have life groups. We have discipleships. We have Sunday services, both online, streaming, and in person. We would love to help you along in this process. Whether you're an unbeliever or whether you're a believer. Because that's what the church is here for. That's what we're here for. I'm going to end with prayer. And during this prayer, I just want you guys just to look internally and see where you are at. Maybe the application that I have, you don't fall in one of those categories. But the passage is true. It's always by faith, through grace, and the reward of God. It's always that way. Trust God. I trust that the Holy Spirit will, will lead you to what the passage means to you. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. Uh, your mercies are new every single morning, and uh, we just don't deserve it. <laughs> All of our good deeds are like filthy rags. Yet, you come and make us white as snow. You come and cleanse us. And you even sent your son to take the punishment for our sins. To take our place, to be a substitute for us. The gospel is simple, but it's not easy. We trust you. We trust that when it's not easy to give up this pride within us, that your Holy Spirit will lead us, will carve away those, those rough edges of our lives. Lord, I ask that you will help us to love the world as you love them. For you love the world that you gave your own son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Allow us to love our neighbors as you have loved us. Allow us to love other brothers and sisters in Christ as you have loved us. Because God, you are love. And there is no love outside of you. Lord, I ask that you will keep us safe as we are traveling home. Keep us safe as we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, unify us through your spirit. All us I pray in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. With Jonas. I invite you to stand for this last song.
ever truly love us. The Spirit move among us. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? Does our God intend to dwell that emphasis that Chase brought out, that salvation doesn't begin with us, it doesn't end with us, it begins with Jesus, and it ends with Jesus, and I trust that you have that faith, that strong faith in your life, and God is at work in your life, and you're growing in your faith. If you're not, man, we would love to help you. I know Chase is available to help you. Reach out to him, chase at ourhcc.org. He'd, be, he'd love to have the opportunity to help you and encourage you. I would too. If you have any questions, if you have any doubts, or if there's anything that we can pray with you about, please let us know. That's what we are here for, and we'd love to have the opportunity to do that. Chase, great job. Great job. Great passage of Scripture. We're proud of you. So, so that passage is so deep, so I want to take that tomorrow in my Monday moments at 1 o'clock and flesh that out just a little bit more because there's so much in that passage. And so if you sit back and say, man, I'd like to know more about that, join us tomorrow at Monday Moments. Send me an email at brian at rhcc.org, and I'll send you a Zoom invite, and you can participate with us. So here's the challenge. As we leave today, let's be reminded that we're not leaving the church. We are the church. And so every day of the week, we are the church. So let me challenge you. Let's be 
the church. This week, let's be the church. Father, we praise you for Jesus. All blessing and honor and glory is due to him. Thank you for what he has done for us. That it's done, it's finished. And Lord, by faith, we receive all of the benefits of our salvation. Help us to live in that faith, to experience that faith. And dismiss us with your blessing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go and be the church. God bless you.